Thursday. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Reza. I'm just kidding. No, I'm, I'm not Reza. Although I look a lot like Reza now with um, the uh, plummeting in the uh, amount of hair on the top of my head. Um, I wanted to honor Reza and his fantastic um, new book that you should all check out. If you haven't heard about it, check out the hype on Twitter. He's got a promo video um, and reflections from many people who were around him slash reviewed the book officially. I highly, highly recommend you check it out. Um, today is Thursday VMR, which means that we will um, we would love to have somebody um, join us in the lukewarm seat to discuss. So we'd love for a volunteer or two volunteers to discuss and for somebody to present a case. So if you have a case, please, please let us know in the chat. Um, and the astute observer, Drew, has noticed that my other half is not here. Um, normally, Sharmin and I do this together, but unfortunately, she's been called away for some clinical responsibilities. And um, so I will be going solo. And the key question today, my friends, is who will who will join me in the lukewarm seat to reflect and who will give us something to reflect about? Ooh, wow. You know, Boris, I saw you. I saw your video. I saw that precious smile. And I was like, I really hope he has a case. And of course, he has delivered. Boris, do you want to unmute yourself and um, reintroduce yourself to the VMR crew? And a plug for somebody to join me in the lukewarm seat um, to reflect on a Boris masterclass. All right, Boris, say hi, please. Hi, everybody. My name is Boris. I'm an infectious disease resident from Serbia, fourth year, currently preparing for my board review, which is in 11 days. 11 days. Boris, it, I feel like you write the test. I, I'm shocked that you have to review for it. Your mm -hmm. knowledge is like no other. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're really, really excited for it. Um, I'll give folks 30 seconds or so to uh, volunteer to um, to discuss. I'm just going to mute myself and bask in the awkward silence until somebody uh, jumps in. All right, 30 seconds, y'all. Let's do it. My dear friend, Dhruv, I'm gonna ask you to hold tight. I'm trying to create, um, I know I can count on you always, but I would love for a fresh, less experienced member to jump in together. All right, who's willing to do it? Who's going to do it? Thanks, Dhruv. I promise. I'm not picking on you. I just saw that you said you were new to the C, um, CP Solvers crew. Do you want to unmute and just introduce yourself? Uh -huh. You don't have to just kind of, you don't just, kind of, you just tell us about yourself. Um, wait, is your name Ravi? Yes, my name is Ravi. Oh. I should probably change it here. Nice to meet you. I've been like uh, listening to your past podcast. So my mentor introduced me to uh, CPS. And nice. so I listened to your podcast. I've been wanting to meet you. Um, oh, I'm a rising second year medical student at um, Chicago, like a medical school in Chicago. Nice. I, I feel like I'm, dra I'm dragging myself into a dark, dark hole. The more I come to VMRs, the more I can't go away with clinical. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think, I think there's something very special about um, today. It is, um, I think most importantly, Juneteenth. Um, a historic day that I think we should all celebrate. And I would reflect on, I would ask you to reflect on, on that. Um, and, um, oh wait, today is the seventh. Oh, my bad. I wanted to tell you to reflect on Juneteenth in many ways. Um, I didn't realize today's the 17th. Wow. I'm actually technically on vacation uh, for this whole week. And so my uh, sense of time is abysmal, but you should check out the, um, the episode that we had with Kimberly Manning last year to reflect on this this week's uh, celebration. But yes, promise. I think uh, um, I think there's nothing better than um, than uh, discussing a case out loud. You have absolutely nothing to lose. It's it'll be you and I just nerding out, um, 
with the help of Boris's guidance and wisdom. So yes, as Simone says, the casual bullying begins, but it's totally up to you. I think what we can do is I can go solo today and, um, and involve the chat like we do on Saturday VMR, or uh, promise if you wanna join, um, you can just type in the chat yes or no. And if you'd rather not, I totally get it. But I think, I think you should, but that's just my opinion, who am I to say? What do you think, yay or nay? Yay or later, how about that? Not nay, we won't take nay on deep solvers. We take yay or later. Um, I feel like if someone else wants to go, maybe they'll go because I haven't learned any of the di like differentials and stuff totally okay. That's next year for me. All right. You got it. We'll be waiting for you next year. Okay. Maybe, maybe you can aim for it. Um, Thursday, June. Oh, not, not Thursday, June 17, 2022. Do we have a deal? All righty. Cool. I love it. If I'm done with step one by then. Oh, I see some caveats coming in. Okay, <laughs> whatever you want, whatever you want, truly. And that really is mostly because Simone's calling me a bully. So I'm trying to like backtrack like five steps now. Okay. Um, you know what, let's do it. Um, I will just ramble away and we'll try to involve, oh, Milan, I don't think you, I don't think we've, ha we haven't discussed together in a long, long time, if at all. So please, um, yeah, let's try your mic out. Uh, hello, Ravi. Uh, hello. hello. Yeah, it sounds great, actually. Do you want to introduce yourself to the rest of the crowd? Oh, yes. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nilayan Sarkar. I'm a fourth year medical student uh, from New Delhi, India. And uh, really excited to be here. Uh, I joined in uh, the family, the CP Solver family, uh, this January, January 2021. And uh, I'm really glad I found you. It was uh, back in January, we had a lockdown, the first lockdown, and it was a uh, really dark times in India. Then uh, our, uh, it opened up and then we had the second wave. And then now we are here with the second wave dying out, but then we are third. Milan, it's a pleasure. I'm glad, I'm really glad to hear that things are getting better um, from a COVID perspective in India and delighted that Part of part of the uh, part of the pain was mitigated by you joining this community, and um, everyone knows, especially on Saturday, your contributions and your participation is so incredibly valuable. Both because you're incredibly kind and generous, but also your wisdom knows no bounds. All right, let's do it, Boris. Let's nerd out together. I have a uh, very interesting case. It is the case. Uh... Uh, which is, uh, I don't know the real date, but uh, I assume it is around 1930 year. So it is really old. And uh, it is the from the book uh, of, of, uh, uh, of medical book from 1957. So. Wow. I, so you're I gonna think... tell me the MRI showed, right? So yes, I... yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do it. Okay. So a 26 year old previously healthy man presented to the clinic with nine days history of fever, malaise and diffuse nodular and pustular erythematous rash. Wow. Is this a good place to stop Boris? What do you think? I think yes. Yeah, let's do it. All right, Milan, you're up. What are you thinking? Well, we have a 26 year old man with nine days of fever. So nine days uh, is sort of subacute. It's not acute in origin, neither is it chronic. And with fever, we can deploy our eye image right? So we have eye for infection, and we for unfortunate DVD. So for fever, we have a source. We can localize the fever, we can localize the infection to skin. And with skin, we see nodular and pustular rash. Uh, with pustules, I obviously would like to uh, put infection ahead of every, every uh, just for causing infection. But uh, we had a case few uh, few days back with uh, anthrax as a cause of skin infection. So uh, we I wouldn't I wouldn't put novel causes too far back. But of course uh, something like staph or strep would be uh, 
further up my list. Um, but apart from that, it can also be autoimmune in origin, something like a pemphigus. Uh, but um, pemphigus and pemphigus are, of course, some system, not like system, uh, having a skin manifestation. So we can spread disease, but manifesting as skin as of now, but it can manifest in some other ways in future. Uh, that's all. I absolutely love that. I really do. I have to say, um, it might be helpful for you to turn your video off because the internet uh, comes in, unfortunately, in and out. And so um, I'll piece together your reflection, uh, which is that I think that you, you really used um, the um, unusual combination of fever and a malaise and a rash to make some tremendous progress, invoking some very common infections and some less common infections driven by the uh, presence of the nodules and the pustules. I completely agree with everything you said. And I think if I were to zoom back out and reflect on the lay of the land we're in, it's a very unusual space to be in. Um, if you take, take, the, take the combination of fever and a rash, most of the time the rash will not provide any guidance as to the source of the fever. In other, in other words, when somebody is really systemically ill, it's very unusual for the skin to provide definitive clues for the cause. So when people have fever and a rash, they usually have a rash from the fever. Um, facial flushing and chest dilation is very common in patients with fever, or they have a non-specific viral exanthem. So most times the fever in a patient who has had fever and a rash, I will tell you that the, the cause of the fever comes from studying the non-cutaneous manifestations. But in some instances, the rash is so peculiar and so different from the nonspecific erythema that accompanies fever, that in this case, you might make a lot of progress by studying the rash. And what we need to know about, um, about the case, first of all, is to understand that the skin is probably only, uh, well, let me say this, let me say it a different way. So step one, Fever plus rash, usually the rash does not provide guidance to the cause of the fever and is too nonspecific. In this instance, however, the nature of the rash is much more specific than the random viral exanthem. And why? It is a nodular rash. Nodules imply deep dermal involvement. And that deep dermal involvement confers a lot of specificity as to the cause and provides insight that the skin is unlikely to be the only place this disease exists because if the disease is nodular in the skin, it's likely to be deep and therefore part of a visceral response to something else. Now, there are exceptions to that, don't get me wrong. The neutrophilic dermatoses like sweet syndrome, lymphoma or leukemia cutis restricted to the skin are good examples of when a nodular process can be limited to the skin. Skin, but the overwhelming probability is a nodular process reflects a disseminated disease process. And that disease process tends to be granulomatous in nature. So it tends to be tuberculosis, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, endemic mycoses, mold, so on and so forth. So where are we? We're in a world where we have an unusual combination of fever and rash. We have fevers with nodules and pustules. Nodules equals deep dermal involvement equals disseminated granulomatous infections, lymphoma or leukemia cutis or neutrophilic dermatosis. What, what about the pustules? Um, the pustules can mean many things. I'd say the association with infections and pustules really brings a couple of possibilities. The most important of which I would say is endocarditis, but then you can't forget about disseminated gonococcal infection and syphilis. So a lot of infections to consider, some sexually transmitted, some granulomatous, but the key thing to recognize here is this is an unusual rash. It's an unusual rash because it confers specificity to the underlying cause and studying it will help us make a lot of progress. But the first step is to say, well, what's the center of gravity? Is it the skin itself? And that's less likely when the skin disease is nodular. And so let's take an inventory of what other organs are involved. All right, Boris, back to you. So his illness started two day, uh, nine days before the current presentation when he developed a fever up to 40 degrees Celsius and malaise. On the next day, he noticed, a, uh, I will use a translation of, uh, of, of uh, text from the book. So it is really old, uh, say, uh, old text. On the next day, he noticed a corn seed sized 
pustil on his right forearm. arm. During the next few days, similar skin changes appeared on his back, head, and arms. Also, he noticed nodular changes under the skin, which were slightly tender. His condition didn't change during the next days. He didn't have any other symptoms. On, do you want me proceed to proceed or? Mm -hmm. On questioning about his personal history, he denied allergies and previous diseases or surgeries. He said, I can't remember when I have been sick for so long. Family history was unavailable in the book. Uh, social history revealed that he moved to the capital three years ago when he started to work as a coachman. He drives a horse drawn carriage. He lives in a small house with only one room and kitchen and under the same roof, he has a stable. He has a horse for the last three years. For all this time, horse was healthy and well fed without any diseases or symptoms. The patient drinks water from the well located in his yard, but also from the city waterworks. I, will, I would stop here. All right, my dear friend, thank you. Milan, where are you at? Um, so, okay. We have some information on uh, fever and rash progression. We now know that fever came first and the rash came secondary. But um, unlike the typical uh, immunocomplex mediated rash, this is a uh, nodular fistular rash. So we know, as you said, it's a deep dermal involvement. So uh, a systemic involvement uh, in that sense, uh, okay, we have a systemic involvement, we know that because uh, we have a back, arm and chest involvement. So we know there's a systemic involvement. So if it's, a, if it's an infection, we know it's in the blood, or it might be in blood, or it might be that it's in nerves and it's spreading across the body, but uh, I see no complaints of pain. If had it, had it been through nerves, uh, I would expect something, uh, uh, I would expect pain to be uh, a complaint here. Apart from that, the nodules are tender. That made me think of infective endocarditis. However, the progression is uh, not very typical of it. We have, uh, we have no allergies, uh, which is a good sign, but uh, uh, the history of drinking water from a well drew my attention. I'm not aware if there is an infection uh, which is transmitted by water which can present like this. However, I briefly thought of uh, typhoid fever and rose rash, but uh, it presents nothing like this. And he is a horse, uh, and he drives a horse carriage, so maybe uh, he got something from the horse itself, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, equine uh, mediated, uh, some equine, in, an infection that spread through uh, horse. But uh, yeah, I am not sure what infection is it or what it can be. Uh, that's where I, I am. No, I think that's brilliant, my friend. I think um, you're using the exposure history to make some connections with the current syndrome. And the truth is that if he, with the same exposure history, had come in with mild fever and runny nose, you wouldn't be doing that. And the reason is you wouldn't be doing that. You'd be like, oh, this is probably an upper respiratory tract infection. And your analysis of his exposure is because of the fact that you think that the, this kind of infection could be acquired from an exposure of that nature. Um, one second, let me just close the window real quick. So in a, you're, you're finding compatibility with a zoonotic infection with the current syndrome. And that I think is um, absolutely terrific. Um, at the end of the day, we're invoking a disseminated, uh, we're worried most about a disseminated um, disease process like this. Um, because of the nodular involvement. And I think the way we make progress is to make the epidemiological connections you just outlined. Could this person have had something acquired from a horse, which there's a short list from? Could this person have acquired some things from the well water, which there's a short list from? Could this person have acquired things from the environment with which he is exposed to outside horses and water like the soil? And um, we can speculate on those range of possibilities. And that's one way to tackle this case as you just did. And I will anxiously await the other dimension, which is we can take an inventory of the other organs that are involved and then marry those two. What exposure does he have and what, what uh, um, organs does he have? And the chat is mentioning an important consideration, which is rotococcus equi, um, a gram positive rod um, uh, that uh, is, is usually actually in immunocompromised patients and acquired through inhalation um, and in, uh, from uh, people in contact with horses. 
Um, the other infections that we associate with horses are tularemia, coxiella, um, and a couple other ones that I'm not, actually not remembering right now. But it's hard not to stay anchored in the world of infections because of the acuity of the fever. And because of the deep dermal involvement, we're worried about a disseminated process. And that disseminated process is usually a disseminated granulomatous infection. Where did it come from? Is it primary cutaneous or is it as it usually is through inhalation of the lung, inhalation from the lungs? I think the exam will tell us a lot more about that. All right, Boris, back to you. <clears throat> so on exam, he is young, muscular, medium height male, alert and oriented. His skin looks dirty and rough. Under the left scapula, there is, there is a, uh, there are four to five big nodular and pustular lesions, which are soft and little tender on touch with the erythematous rim. Similar but smaller lesions were seen on his forearms and his back and the backside of his forelegs. Big nodular erythematous skin change is present in the area of left ankle, uh, which looks like a, uh, an abscess. His face has a serious and painful grimace. His tongue is moist and slightly coated in white. His lungs are clear to auscultation, but his breathing is fast. Respiratory rate, 32 breaths per minute. Auscultation of the heart was without murmurs, but it was faint and his heart rate was elevated, 124. He was slightly hypotensive. Values are not available in the book. His abdomen was soft, not tender. His spleen is not palpable. The rest of the exam was unremarkable. <laughs> the lab, this is absolutely fascinating how we're having to de deduce this data. And I would just say kudos to any diagnostician making diagnoses in the 1930s without a pulse ox, a blood pressure, and a chest x-ray. This is marvelous. All right, what are you thinking, my friend? Well, I agree. It's hard to uh, go on with this little data, but okay, let's try. So uh, I was perplexed with the nine-day history and only having skin manifestation, but then we came across with, um, we were hit with vitals. Now we have a respiratory rate of 32 per minute. We have an elevated heart rate and a decreased BP, which points to mere cardiopulmonary involvement, right? And as we, uh, as we hypothesized that we are considering an infection right now, and that infection has to have some entry point, right? Uh, but, uh, and, but uh, and from, uh, Okay, so if it's ingested, we would expect some sort of GI involvement. If it was inhaled, we would expect some sort of pulmonary involvement. But uh, right now, we had none. With the high respiratory rate, I'm inclined to think that this patient might have some sort of pneumonia, which uh, we have not caught yet. And again, uh, one more point I had to make is uh, the patient is remarkably asymptomatic despite uh, the florid skin manifestations. Is the patient immunocompromised? Uh, in the sense, is it primary or secondary? I was thinking of uh, in terms of CJD, uh, a CJD that is chronic granulitis disease, uh, mainly because uh, the patient has abscess, but uh, okay, the patient has inflammation. So maybe CJD, I would uh, put a little down my list. But uh, given the lack of symptoms, uh, sort of immunocompromised state uh, does pop into my mind. And the patient is young, I guess. So, uh, okay, maybe not diabetes. Uh, I, I'm basically thinking of immunocompromised states that may hide a uh, uh, focal infection, maybe in abdomen, maybe uh, in lungs, maybe, as you mentioned, I think there's a focal infection, uh, colitis, cholangitis, pneumonia, UDI, uh, bacteremia, cellulitis, in those terms. But I see nothing uh, except uh, uh, increased respiratory rate or heart rate. So maybe uh, some sort of pneumonia, I'm I think circling back and back again, or maybe infective endocarditis as well. So that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. You know, um, I, you know, what I love about your analysis is somehow you were able to convey so much with a minute or two. You taught us that the route of exposure is key and you're worried based on the respiratory rate that a pulmonary focus of disease, which is not apparent on exam, may be present. You also told us um, to prioritize um, really the assessment you prioritize the assessment of endocarditis, but mitigated that because of the extent of the cutaneous involvement. And... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm right there with you. I think that it's hard not to speculate on the possibility of an immunodeficiency. And the truth is when I heard white stuff on the tongue, I wondered, hey, is this an immunodeficiency uh, reflecting mucocutaneous candidiasis and this patient have HIV? And then I realized this patient could not have HIV. Literally impossible for a patient in the 1930s to have HIV. So the best test 
um, to rule out HIV is to have been alive in the 1930s. Um, so where do we go from here? I think in the modern era, you would clarify this, um, you would clarify this by studying the pul presumed pulmonary focus with imaging. And then um, you would step back and say like, okay, is there a way that I, I don't make prog, is there a way that I can confirm this diagnosis in the modern era? And that probably would be studying this, the, and studying and biopsying the rash, but also um, culturing the blood for endocarditis, as we talked about, looking for um, fungal markers based on the CT scan, looking for cryptococcal antigen. Um, but in the 1930s, when you look at this and you're like, well, this is a fever of 40, fever of 40, a heart rate of 124, and a patient with presumed pulmonary disease and, and nodular skin lesions, how is this not disseminated tuberculosis? And I think that the practical dimension may be um, for isolation and wondering about the possibility of TB, recognizing that occult immunodeficiency may expand the horizon to endemic mycoses, to cryptococcus, um, to rhodococcus. Um, and at the same time, you know, um, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So we're in the, I think we're in the world of granulomatous infections as you outlined. I'm, I'm really intrigued to see what tools are available to the treating providers of this patient to make a diagnosis, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And it's amazing and humbling to me how much, uh, you know, a mere ninety years later, a case like this would probably be diagnosed in a day or two um, with biopsy, serology, cultures, and imaging. But I don't know how this. I, I'm really intrigued to see how this unfolds. So back to you, Boris. Hey, do you want to uh, tell you more about clinical presentation or clinical course or one of some labs? You know, well, I think your wisdom, whatever you think would be uh, most fun to talk about, either way, or both, whatever you want. Okay, I, I will go with, uh, with labs. So we have a, a little lab so <laughs> from that time. Uh, white blood cell count was 16 with 70. 5% of neutrophils, 20% of lymphocytes, 3% of monocytes. Urine studies revealed protein, but no glucose or cells. Diazo reaction was negative. This is the old test for bilirubin in urine. Vidal reaction was performed and the test revealed an interesting result. Bacillus typhi, actually Salmonella typhi, but in that time it's called Bacillus typhi, and Bacillus paratyphi A was positive. The result for Bacillus paratyphi B was equivocal. Vale-Felix reaction with Bacillus proteus, actually proteus mirabilis, X90 was negative. This is the old test for, the, for Rickettsia. And this is the old test I, I have. My dear friend, Milan, you were worried about typhoid fever and here you are having a test that says this patient might have, have typhoid fever. Thoughts? Uh, uh, yeah, okay. So now we have the vitals and now we, we see WBC of 16. Uh, that means we have, a, uh, we may have an infection, but neutrophils is high. So we, uh, we are focused more of the typical infection as compared to the more exotic kind. Okay. So, uh, urine has proteins, which is uh, sort, of, sort of expected because uh, some sort of protein is always positive and we don't have how much protein we have. So I cannot literally say if it's nephrotic or nephritic and we don't have RBC, so nephritic is literally out. So I can't say if it's nephrotic or not, or if we have a kidney involvement or not. Bilirubin is negative, uh, which sort of does nothing for us. I mean, it cannot rule out a hepatic involvement, but it does make me uh, kind of uh, uh, happy that the patient uh, hepatic system is all right. Uh, and salmonella typhi is positive, which is very interesting because patient didn't have any of the typical symptoms. And with the lack of typical symptoms, again, I'm inclined to think if the patient is immunocompromised or not, because I would expect a history of maybe diarrhea or constipation. Uh, basically, I think typhoid has a step of pattern of fever, but the patient did have a history of fever and that was a very high fever. So patient does have uh, maybe one symptom of uh, fever with rash. Fever with rash is sort of typical of typhoid, but that is a very, uh, uh, that is, we don't have enough data to prove 
uh, it's typhoid just based on the clinical symptoms. We need something. We need a GI symptom, maybe to pinpoint that it's at least typhoid. We don't have that. Uh, so, of course, and also, we cannot rule out the typhoid test was false positive, right? Uh, it's uh, 1937, so false positive uh, could, be a, could be a huge factor, or maybe uh, we can have an, uh, a different infection, which is uh, masquerading as a salmonella typhoid to the test. So, depending on what test we use, because the test uh, can be fooled, uh, we have many chronic conditions. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm not sure if it's the Vidal test we are using here or the Vidal test was invented back then. But if it's the Vidal, Vidal then Vidal has uh, is notorious for having false positives. And if it's Vidal, it can also have uh, many other conditions that is masquerading as typhoid. So yeah, that's that's where I'm at. I love it. You're not trusting this test, my friend. You're not trusting it. And let's reflect on that in a second. I think um, I think that uh, your ability to to generate hypotheses based on you not trusting this test is marvelous. And you're not trusting this test because the test could be inherently flawed. It could be picking up another organism. And, um, and then I love what you're doing with the UA. You're like, this doesn't help me much. It's nonspecific as is the white count. It's nonspecific elevation. I'm a little, um, I think what we can do in this case is um, be anchored in some concrete things. A nodular rash is likely reflective of a disseminated disease process. Tachypnea typically represents um, pulm a pulmonary disease process, further supporting that the nodular rash is actually a pulmonary origin, but maybe nonspecific as a result of acidosis, so on and so forth. What can we do with the labs? The white counts um, elevated and therefore the patient's inflamed, but that comes to no surprise to us because of the, um, the height of the fever. And the question is, we have a test and we have that test that says that salmonella typhi is positive. And I have nothing to add um, to the land's absolutely brilliant analysis that I see the chat is um, also appreciating. I think a final dimension to incorporate is the base rate. And the base rate is this idea that common things are so common that whenever they, whenever you're uh, in a world in which they could exist, like somebody who's short of breath, COPD exacerbation is very common. No matter what you have to think about it. But that comes with a double-edged sword. The base rate is a double-edged sword because something is so common, it might just be a bystander. What do I mean here? This patient could hypothetically have chronic typhoid fever because in that era, it was so, so, so common that um, whatever is going on now is actually just occurred on the background of something very common like salmonella typhi. And um, if you look at the classic description of salmonella typhi, this is not a case that mirrors that very well. While salmonella is an aggressive, high, highly febrile illness, with a propensity for CNS involvement and abscess formation, meaning that patients usually present with fever, some subtle GI symptoms, but then have CNS disease and have a propensity to form abscesses everywhere, liver, spleen, um, kidney, um, endovascular, bone. The skin involvement is usually subtle and rarely appreciated and often missed, not aggressive nodular lesions. So I think the key question is, does this patient have an atypical present, presentation of salmonella typhi or is salmonella typhi the test as in the land outline falsely positive or just reflective of chronic carrier? Um, in which case the analysis of all the disseminated granulomatous infections, tuberculosis, non-tuberculosis, ulcer, ulcer, Lewis malignant or malignant syphilis, I mean, the list is infinite. So um, short answer is, I agree with you. I don't think this is um, salmonella typhi. And I think that we're still there in the world of disseminated granulomatous infections with likely the origin being lungs, which favors TB, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, but maybe the plague, maybe tularemia, um, maybe rhodococcus, maybe syphilis, many, many possibilities. All right, Boris, take us home. Okay, so on the third day of hospitalization, the patient was feeling worse. He barely can move in his bed. He was still conscious and oriented beside his severe illness. On his face, chest, arms, and legs, a great number of new erythematous lesions appeared. Skin changes were different in size and morphology. There were 
pustules, big nodular softened erythematous swellings, and skin infiltrates of crimson color. The skin was uneven and with numerous bulges. Previous skin lesions became big ulcers with, uh, from which thick green and sticky pus with a sweetish unpleasant smell was draining. Ulcers has, had eroded edges, edges. His sclera was injected with blood. His tongue was dry and leathery. The yellow mucus was draining from his nose, which quickly becomes dry above his upper lip. His breathing was nasal and fast. He didn't have vomiting, diarrhea, or cough. The diuresis was normal. Do you want me to proceed further? Or? I think so. I think we'll need a little bit more information. OK. The gram stained blood smear and smear of pus from one of the skin changes showed gram negative bacilli. All right, my friend. What do you think? So, yeah, I was worried about jaundice, and now we have jaundice. Uh, we have, uh, okay, so big ulcer uh, exude a big uh, green sticky pus with sweet smell. If I'm not wrong, that's typical of a pseudomonas because pseudomonas culture is sweet smelling. And the fact that we have gram negative bacilli uh, makes me uh, think of that. But I cannot be sure if it's a pseudomonas or their brother, something like aeromonas. I'm not very sure if it's characteristic of aeromonas either. But okay, let's see. And um, okay, if it's pseudomonas, then is it sepsis? If, is it sepsis or do we have some source which we haven't been able to localize? And if it's a source, uh, if the uh, does the patient have any uh, concomitant uh, immunocompromised uh, state, uh, which we haven't looked at? Because uh, nine days is a bit too long for a sepsis to manifest, and pseudomonas is notoriously a very, uh, uh, what do you say, malignant sort of, a uh, very fast. It, uh, it's very, uh, um, it's fast. It's fast. It, uh, it makes the patient go worse very, very quickly. It decomposes very fast. So uh, nine days is a bit too long for a sepsis to manifest, and. Uh, well, we have skin, we have a GI, uh, we don't have any nausea vomiting. So maybe the GI tract can be ruled out as a source, but we do have uh, lungs, potential, uh, we do have lungs as a potential source. We can have GI as a potential source, something like cholangitis, uh, but we didn't have any right upper cordon pain. So can't really say, can't really localize it to uh, the hepatobiliary tree either. Uh, we didn't have any urinary complaints, that also is ruled out. Uh, so I am mostly anchoring around lungs, or maybe a sepsis. How did the sepsis set in? Maybe a primary skin break caused the pseudomonas to enter, and then it went around and around, around and around, and then caused uh, the manifestation. But if I remember, there is no splenomegaly, which is um, sort of uh, perplexing, perplex, uh, perplexing, because I would expect some sort of uh, splenomegaly in a sort of sepsis, in, in, the, uh, in the picture of sepsis for nine days. So I'm a bit perplexed at this point. I really cannot say what is happening, except to say that the patient needs some antibiotics because we have a potential pseudomonas sepsis. I think that's brilliant, my friend. You took the you took the combination of gram negative uh, gram negative bacilli and green sputum to prioritize pseudomonas, and I think that has to be a very important thing we think about. In fact, uh, uh, what we call eczema gang gangrenosum is a manifestation of disseminated pseudomonas. Um, which may be something to entertain here, though patients with eczema gangrenosum typically have um, a singular lesion and not disseminated. So again, we you, to go back to your immunodeficiency um, hypothesis, does this patient have disseminated pseudomonas as a manifestation of eczema gangrenosum? And I think that's something very, very important to think about. And in parallel with that, we have to think about the other gram-negative rods that can do this. And that really, are, there's really five of them in total. I would say that what prominent gram-negative rods can cause um, disseminated severe skin disease without any filters? Bad skin disease gram-negative rods. I'd say it's miliodosis, pseudomonas, tularemia, um, yersinia, and, and salmonella, hypothetically. I don't think salmonella can really do it. So we're down to the four. Is this miliodosis, pseudomonas, tularemia, or yersinia? I think. Um, I'd say that pseudomonas is a possibility for sure, though I expect that, that the disease to be much more disseminated viscerally. And we don't have, an, we don't have evidence of that, but, but pseudomonas married with disseminated skin disease is unusual. But that has to be balanced by the fact um, that this patient has greenest sputum. So could this be pseudomonas for that reason? 
So I'd say the amount of skin disease makes pseudomonas a little bit less likely and the amount of green sputum makes it, a greenish discharge makes it more likely. Um, but here, I think you also have to worry about uh, uh, tularemia um, with horrible disseminated skin disease and neurocinia. How can you distinguish them? You might wonder about um, how, how the time course. Um, Tulare of all of all the three organisms we talk about as potential bioterrorism organisms, Yersinia, Tularemia, and anthrax, which we reviewed anthrax recently, Tularemia is the only one with a potential indolent course. Now, is 13, 14 days indolent? Maybe, maybe not. But if this actually lingers on for a long period of time, it's unlikely to be the plague because the plague is so deadly. So <laughs> I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. I think your point about emphasizing pseudomonas is very well taken with the green sputum. I think it could be Yersinia. I think it could be tularemia. Um, or we have to acknowledge, hey, is this patient have an incidental colonizer by a gram negative rod, which would be very unusual and actually has something else. Um, so can we prioritize one over the other? I don't know. I really don't know. And I cannot wait to learn. All right, Boris, back to you. You said sputum so many times. <laughs> I know, right? You can tell how my you can tell how uh, I, my mind is just been. I no, not sputum discharge, but I will say sputum probably again even before we're done. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, during the next few days, his condition progressively worsened. He became confused. He was trying to rise from the bed, but soon because of malaise and fatigue, he, uh, he would lay down. Nasal secretion was more pronounced. New skin changes appeared every day and under the skin of his thighs, the nodular swelling in the size of pigeon eggs can be palpated. He started refusing water and food. With the signs of heart failure, he, the patient soon died. And the diagnosis, the blood culture, culture showed Bacillus malae, actually Burkholderia malae, called today. So the patient has glanders. Wow, teach us more, my friend, please. And I'll ask Boris to teach us more and then the lion to reflect. Okay, about glanders. So uh, glanders primarily affects animals and can be transmitted both from animal to animal and animal to human, while human to human transmission is rare. It is caused by Burkholderia malae, gram-negative non-motile bacillus. It is highly infectious and mortality is very high, up to 95% in untreated cases and high as 50% in treated cases. Today, it is rare infection, which is exists in Africa, Asia, Middle East, Central and South America. Most human cases during the 20th century were occupational infections among laboratory workers, horse handlers, butchers, butchers, and veterinaries. It is not an environmental pathogen, and its main reservoir is animals, and it primarily causes the disease of horses, mules, and donkeys. The mode of infection in glanders is not at all clear and probably includes inhalation, percutaneous inoculation, and, and ingestion. Purulent discharge from infected animal respiratory tract or skin is highly contagious and it is prime route of natural transmission among horses. The incubation, the incubation period may range from one to five days in acute, in acute case and few months in chronic cases. Human glanders, if acquired by the inhalation route, can produce fever, ulcerative necrosis of upper and lower respiratory tract with purulent na nasal discharge, extensive pneumonia, cervical and mediastinal lymphadenopathy, and pustular skin lesions, which may resemble smallpox. Prostration out of proportion to clinical sign is a classical finding. Septicemia followed the involvement of various internal organs, such as in melidiosis. Without treatment, death almost invariably occurs within 10 days. Chronic human glanders is associated with multiple subcutaneous and intramuscular abscesses, lymphadenopathy and lymphangitis, and involves half of the naturally occurring inf infections. Drugs that can be active against Burkholderia malae are ceftazidim, tetracyclines, imipenem, chloramphenicol, and trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole. 
Burkholder Yamali have a history of being on list of potential biological warfare agents. The Center of Disease Control and Prevention classifies uh, Burkholder Yamali as a category B criti uh, critical biological agent. I am just so humbled. I have the only association I have with the word blenders is random exposure through classes or first aid or whatever. I had, and this was definitely not on my mind. And I'm not the least bit surprised that Boris is humbling us and teaching us yet again today. I have so much to read on, so much to reflect on. And from Boris's teaching can only um, develop some analogical reasoning to how similar this infection seems to be to the list of five that we um, came. So came up with. So hopefully it'll be the list of six for me very soon. Um, and Alain, what are, what are your thoughts and reflections? Oh, yeah, totally mind blown. As um, well, I consider board, a work called area to be a sibling of Sudomonas, maybe a small victory for me, uh, in my own mind, of course. And uh, work called area oh, no, and I, I, everybody's mind, in everybody's yeah. mind. And uh, Bakul, Bakul Lira Mali and uh, Sudo Mali, I believe they cause uh, blanders and parsley, and they are typically present in the uh, nasal secretion of horses. So the answer was, uh, was literally in front of us, and uh, we couldn't see, and that's okay. Well, with the last aliquot, uh, Boris mentioned something about nasal secretions and uh, profuse secretions from the uh, nose. And I started thinking about syphilis, and I'm glad I didn't speak that aloud. And uh, well, yeah, something new to learn every day, and uh, it's been a phenomenal case. Thank you, Boris. Uh, thank you, Rabi. Uh, always a pleasure. Boris, truly, thank you so much. Humbled and learn, going to learn a lot from this. And Elian, again, um, your discussion really knows no bounds. Thank you so much. All right, to my friend Kirtan, take us home, please. Yes, so amazing days. Thanks to Boris for presenting and our discussion by Rabi and Elian. So the story began back in 1930s with a patient presenting with fever and nulopistular rash. The so, has to be pointed out that the characteristics of rash is critical to get to the underlying diagnosis. Now, usually rashes are insignificant. But when you have a deep seated rashes like ruler rashes, then maybe they point to underlying disseminated processes. And very early on, we were coming the possibility of dendromatous disease. That could be tuberculosis, could it be non tuberculous mycobacteria, could it be disseminated syphilis? And then when we got epidemiological clues, like the patient had exposed to horses, then we had another atypical organism like Rhodococcus equi intumans. That what if this is a case of Rhodococcus? And then the patient had exposure to well water. Well, I think we lost our friend Kirtan. I'm going to give him a second to try to. Oh no. Hey y'all, I think we lost him. Yeah, he's gone. Um, that's okay. I'll, I'll try to summarize um, the learning points from today in uh, 30 seconds, which is nodule equals deep. Unlikely to be the skin alone. Most uh, disseminated nodular diseases come from the lungs. We, um, later learned that this is a gram negative rod with disseminated skin disease in the form of ulcers and nodules um, and had come up with a list of five things to prioritize, pseudomonas, tularemia, yersinia, miliodosis, and salmonella. And finally added a sixth one, which is glanders or burcordelia malii, which I cannot teach you about because I have a lot to learn. Uh, but what I learned from is from Boris is now a much rarer infection, is zoonotic transmission, horses and other exposures, and has a clinical presentation analogous to um, its cousin Burkholdelia pseudomalii um, with skin manifestations, pulmonary manifestations, and a very hectic uh, lethal presentation. All right, y'all, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you all for RLR and a special thanks to Nalan and Boris again for a wonderful hour and hope you learned something. I know I have a lot more reflecting and thinking to do. Bye.